As we continue our study of English poetry, we've, we're coming to classical backgrounds. We did uh, backgrounds in Bible last month, so now we're moving into classical backgrounds, and I'd like to break this up into two lectures. So tonight we're going to be focusing on the Greeks, and next week we'll focus on the Romans. And you know, I never revisit the classical traditions without feeling a profound sense of gratitude for how much the Greeks and Romans actually gave us. It's pretty incredible. I'll discuss in this lecture Homer, Plato, and Aristotle. And if you've never read any of Homer or Plato or Aristotle, um, I almost envy you for being able to encounter these great artists and thinkers for the first time. And it's my hope in giving these lectures that you will be tempted and emboldened to experience these works of literature on your own, even in translation. Uh, I hope I can dispel any anxiety and inhibition that you might have uh, toward reading classical literature for the first time. And for those who are unfamiliar with classical literature, this lecture um, will provide a map for your own private explorations of these rich landscapes. I'll point out some major highways and recommend a few stops along the way. But uh, for those of you well acquainted with this terrain, I hope that this lecture will reveal more clearly the wonderful gifts that this tradition has given us, has given poets in the English tradition. Now, as, as I was telling, I'm gathered here with my Patreon supporters who we're going to have a discussion about the lecture after, afterwards with. I was just discussing um, with Jeffrey, who, who is a classicist, that I am not a classicist scholar. And unlike some of my colleagues in my department, I do not read the Greeks in their original languages. And this is not a lecture about Greek poetry per se, but it is about the major contributions of Greek poetry to the thought of English literature, which is more my expertise, and it's from that place as an English literature student uh, from which I'll be approaching. So to distill all of these contributions is no easy task. We could easily spend an entire course on it. And Gilbert Higgett's textbook, The Classical Tradition, is probably the go-to. I listed it in my uh, in the Harvard list. It was included there. It's massive uh, breadth, depth of the influence of Greek poetry and, and Latin poetry upon the Western traditions. Uh, so if you're interested in that, definitely check out that book. But I've narrowed it down for this lecture into three major literary endowments. And the first major endowment to English literature is the representation of human passion as the source of action that drives plot and character. Passion itself and its representation. So that's the first, that's the first endowment. So I want to turn our attention to Homer. This is one of the most enduring values of classical Greek, its treatment and representation of human pass passion. Uh, the Greek lyricists, the dramatic poets, the epic po poet Homer, uh, all provided a vocabulary and a template for understanding the chaos of human emotion and by making it an interesting subject for poetry. The poetry of ancient Greece brings the human heart and all its turmoil into the light of thought, of drama, and of understanding, and, and he causes it to shine. This is partly what makes Homer's two epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, so enduring. Now, if you are about to read the Iliad for the first time, do not expect Wolfgang Peterson's movie Troy. Uh, there is a, a lot of action. It begins with the fury of Achilles. The narrative commences with an invocation to the muse. And the story begins in media res, in the middle of things which is actually in the concluding stages of the Trojan War, the conflict between the besieging Achaeans, led by King Agamemnon, and the Greeks in their city of Troy, or in, in, and the Trojans within their city of Troy. So the Achaeans versus the Trojans largely. It begins when Agamemnon robs Achilles of his slave Briseis, and this insult rouses Achilles into passion, into a passion rather. Achilles withdraws his forces, the Myrmidons, from the war. And this leads to complications within the war. Now, I'd like to begin with just a few, by reading just a few lines of the Iliad. 
Aristotle said that uh, tragedy, like epic poetry, produces its effect even without action, just by merely reading it. The power is revealed in the reading of it. And so uh, I'm going to read a translation by uh, Robert Fagels, which is what I read. It begins, Rage, goddess. Sing the rage of Peleus' son, Achilles, murderous, doomed, that cost the Achaeans countless losses, hurling down to the house of death so many sturdy souls, great fighters' souls, but made their bodies carrion, feasts for the dogs and birds, and the will of Zeus was moving toward its end. Begin, Muse, when the two first broke and clashed, Agamemnon, lord of men, and brilliant Achilles. And that is the first uh, pericope here. It's this conflict, this, this insult, this injury that sparks the narrative. The poet is asking the Muse, daughter of Zeus, to inspire and to begin there. Um, and this is an interesting point uh, about the poem, is that it's not like the movie Troy, uh, in, in that you, you don't get the full war. The war is ending, uh, is still going on by the time you get to the end of the Iliad. I just want to share something that Gilbert Higgett, from that book I just held up, The Classical Tradition, something he says about the Iliad, what it's about. He writes that the Iliad is not about the siege of Troy, although because of Homer's genius, it implies the ten years fighting and the final capture. For primitive man, the stimulus to action and to poetry is single, an insult, a woman, a monster, or a treasure. Heroic poetry seldom describes successes unless against fearful odds. It prefers to tell the defeat which makes the brave man braver and rounds off his life. I think that's a good thing to keep in mind when, if you're reading this for the first time, I read the Iliad when I was around 16, it was around the same time I read Paradise Lost. And I was, I read it partly because I wanted to hear about the Trojan horse. And I was very disappointed as I was finishing the final book uh, at this point to find that the war was still going on after the ending. Um, but, you know, Aristotle says of the Iliad, it's excellent because Homer does not make the whole Trojan War its subject. Um, to have done so would have made it too vast, Aristotle says in his Poetics. Um, the scene would have been too great, and the poem would have lost its simplicity of form, passion, action. That is what impels this poem. When you read it, you have to be sensitive to its energy, and you probably will pick it up. You'll probably pick up this energy, uh, especially if you're reading it aloud. Call upon your powers of the imagination to engage with this poem, especially his descriptions. This is a poem of, of action. It's interesting thinking about passion. I, from the Harvard list of recommendations, there were many recommendations when I did that video. I also recommended Euripides' Tragedy Medea. It's an interesting case study against Achilles because you have Medea who also is insulted and she's at home in her own homeland. Uh, she is the queen, but she's being replaced by another woman. She winds up wreaking havoc and bloodshed upon her, her own house, killing her own children. And it's interesting to, to see that this, the place in time of passion there, displaced, just as almost a mirror image it is with Achilles, who is not at home, but in the battlefield where one would expect to shed blood, where it's proper to do so. And yet he withholds it in his rage. And it's, it's that, it's an interesting effect of, of pulling back in a response to rage instead of pouring forth, but different contexts, the domestic world in which rage is being affected in violence in Medea, and then also in Achilles where, it's, where rage is being affected by um, withholding it. And it's interesting too, Euripides is Medea because it's a good case study of how uh, when, a woman's revenge is enacted on the stage. And Aristotle mentions Medea in his uh, poetics, which we're going to get to at the end.
So as many rhetoricians of Greece and Rome and even England have noted, the representations of passion are fittingly cast into figurative language, repetitions, uh, schemes, metaphors, similes. For Homer, those figures were, were similes, those explicit comparisons of one thing to another. And we've all heard, or perhaps we, we've heard, the famous descriptions from Homer that make their way into our poetry, the wine dark sea, or the rosy fingered dawn. But there is what is called the epic simile, a long formal comparison that lasts many lines. And I want to turn our attention from Fagel's translation to Alexander Pope's uh, translation in which we're going to see an epic simile. This is the description of the Achaean, of the Achaean troops rushing back to their ships. It's from Alexander Pope, who uh, was an excellent poet, writing in the beginning of the 18th century. And he writes in heroic couplets. Here we have, right off the beginning, the simile as, beginning with that explicit comparison. As from some rocky cleft the shepherd sees, clustering in heaps on heaps the driving bees, rolling and blackening, swarms succeeding swarms, with deeper murmurs and more hoarse alarms. Dusky they spread, a close embodied crowd, and o'er the veil descends the living cloud. So from the tents and ships a lengthened train spreads all the beach and wide o'er shades the plain. Along the region runs the deafening sound beneath their footsteps groans the trembling ground. So that's an example of one of the many epic similes. Pope beautifully captures the vigor and vitality of Homer in these very English couplets. So if you like the inevitable pace and the, the trot of, of Pope's couplets and, and meter, if they don't offend your modern sensibilities, you just might try experiencing the Iliad through, through his translation. It's good. Now, after you have experienced this poem in some translation, uh, or if you can read ancient Greek, gosh, after you've experienced it in the Greek, um, you might also like Alice Oswald's memorial. This was a loose translation of the Iliad that was published in 2011. Alice Oswald, great poet, uh, classicist scholar, uh, and this memorial is a translation of Iliad's atmosphere, not the story. She makes that very clear. It's not a literal translation of the story, but just the, the feeling, what's called energia. Here's the cover of it. And in her preface, she writes, Matthew Arnold, a Victorian critic, he has an excellent essay on translating Pope. Matthew Arnold, in almost everyone ever since, has praised the Iliad for its nobility. But ancient critics praised it for its energia, which means something like bright, unbearable reality. And I just want to read from just a passage here from Oswald. Let's see it. This is the scene describing Hector, Prince of Troy, his premonition of his death. And we know that Hector will be killed by Achilles. Let's see. And she plays with white space. You see how this poem begins at the bottom of this page. And Hector died like everyone else. He was in charge of the Trojans. But a spear found out the little patch of white between his collarbone and his throat, just exactly where a man's soul sits, waiting for the mouth to open. He always knew it would happen. He who was so boastful and anxious and used to nip home to deafened by weapons, to stand in full armor in the doorway, like a man rushing in, leaving his motorbike running. All women loved him. His wife was Andromache. One day, he looked at her quietly. He said, I know what will happen. And an image stared at him of himself dead 
and her in Argos weaving for some foreign woman. He blinked and went back to his work. Hector loved Andromache, but in the end he let her face slide from his mind. He came back to her sightless, strengthless, expressionless, asking only to be washed and burned and his bones wrapped in soft cloths and returned to the ground. It's such an elegiac translation. And she explains this in the, in the preface of it. But this is, I mean, it's, it's so, so you get the atmosphere, you get what she's doing with the, with the simile, not so much epic, but uh, connecting it to modern times with that, like a man rushing in, leaving his motorbike running. Um, there's something so affecting and lifelike about that. So this is a good example of how this poem continues to inspire poetry and translation. Now, if the Iliad is a poem of action, then the Odyssey is a poem of narrative. It's a story, a story of what happens to the hero Odysseus after he and the other Greeks defeat Troy. Uh, it is, it's a poem about going home. I've, I've, I've read the, my first reading was Fitzgerald, Robert Fitzgerald's The Odyssey. Um, and I've, I've just stuck with this one, but there are, there are good ones out there. Uh, Robert Fagels has one, which I've not read. I just want to read the beginning of The Odyssey here. And it begins with that invocation again. Sing in me, muse. And through me tell the story of that man skilled in all ways contending, the wanderer, harried for years on end, after he plundered the stronghold on the proud height of Troy. He saw the townlands and learned the minds of many distant men and weathered many bitter nights and days in his deep heart at sea while he fought only to save his life to bring his shipmates home. But not by will nor valor could he save them, for their own recklessness destroyed them all, children and fools. They killed and feasted on the cattle of Lord Helios, the sun, and he who moves all day through heaven, took from their eyes the dawn of their return. Of these adventures, muse, daughters of Zeus, tell us in our time, Lift the great song again. Begin when all the rest who left behind them headlong death in battle or at sea had long ago returned, while he alone still hungered for home and wife. Homer's Odyssey narrates the arduous ten-year journey of Odysseus, king of Ithaca, detailing his perilous voyages across treacherous seas and these mythical landscapes facing many dangers. And Odysseus perseveres through cunning intellect, which he's known for. He was the architect of the Trojan horse. He's also known for his determination, ultimately yearning for the solace of his homeland and the faithful embrace of his wife, Penelope who all this time has been fending off a throng of opportunistic suitors while he's been away fighting and trying to get back. The narrative spanning both the physical and internal landscapes of Odysseus's struggle explores these themes of trying to get home, homecoming, loyalty, and the enduring human spirit in the face of adversity. Having read the beginning, let me read you the end, uh, towards the end. When he finally comes home and reveals himself and confirms himself to his wife, Penelope. After all those years, and this is all the way at the end, at book 23, lines 233. Now, I'm, actually, I'm going to begin at line 259, when she recognizes him. And it says, now from his breath, and this is Odysseus, 
Now from his breast into his eyes the ache of longing mounted, and he wept at last. His dear wife, clear and faithful in his arms, longed for as the sun-warmed earth is longed for by a swimmer spent in rough water where his ship went down under Poseidon's blows, gale winds, and tons of sea. Few men can keep alive through a big surf to crawl, clotted with brine, on kindly beaches in joy, in joy, knowing the abyss behind. And so she too rejoiced, her gaze upon her husband, her white arms round him pressed as though forever. The rose dawn might have found them weeping still, had not gray-eyed Athena slowed the night when the night was most profound, and held the dawn under the ocean of the east. That glossy team, fire-bright and day-bright, the dawn's horses that draw her heavenward for men, Athena stayed their harnessing. Just beautiful. And as a reader, when you, when you finally get through these books and you come to the end and he finally reveals himself to his wife, you feel like that swimmer longing for the sun-warmed earth so satisfied and of course the reunion lasts longer than it naturally would because Athena prolonged the night uh, just beautiful and that's another thing Robert mentioned in the comments here that the film Troy omits the gods from the Iliad uh, and that's that's part of the spiritual character and fiber of these of these books the intervention of the gods and what they choose to intervene in whether asked or not I find that so affecting that Athena would do that. Um, it's beautiful. And I, I, I hesitate to cloud it with commentary. The first century critic Longinus speculated that the Iliad was written in Homer's youth and that the Odyssey was written in his old age. And it does seem like a poem for a person who has experienced much, a person either in old age or one who has seen battle or hardship. And I think we see that throughout the centuries, those who are full of life experiences, homesickness, world weariness, they've all turned to the Odyssey for consolation and for entertainment. I mean, you can just get lost in these beautiful translations of these, of these works. And this is partly why the Victorian uh, poet Alfred Lord Tennyson chose Ulysses, which is the Latinized name of the Greek Odysseus, as an emblem of anyone who has lived life well and possesses the determination to keep living well. I just would like to share with you that just a portion of that poem, because um, we must we must go on. Um, here's a passage from Ulysses. Where to begin? Of course, I'm not going to read it all. Um, but there's this, this is a beautiful portion. Uh, and he's writing in the, in the 19th century. And this is a, an utterance inspired by, by Homer's Odyssey. This is Ulysses speaking on the shore. He's made it back. He's home. He's made peace. He's back with his wife and removed the suitors. And he's standing on the shore wanting more. He says, I am a part of all that I have met. Yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. How dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in use. As though to breathe were life, life piled on life were all too little, and if one to me little remains. But every hour is saved from that eternal silence, something more, a bringer of new things. And vile it were for some three sons to store and hoard myself, and this gray spirit, the yearning and desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought doesn't want to stop. 
And then he has this resolution, which we're familiar with, I think. He says, this is the end of the poem. Come, my friends. It is not too late to seek a newer world. Push off, and sitting well in order, smite the sounding furrows, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that the gulfs will watch, will wash us down. It may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which we, which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. A passage from Tennyson's Ulysses represents human spirit and its determination, and even in old age, or even in adversity, or to press on. So, passion. First in doubt, representation of passion, I think. What's the second? And these two will go a little bit more quickly. And deal with with Plato and Aristotle, respectively, in their endowments, which I think is a spiritual character. Homer is full of the spiritual energy of the Greeks, and that very energy, which is perhaps the most essential and the most portable of all literary virtues, we can see in the English tradition as well. The spiritual character of Greek philosophy infused literature and Western thought and religion as well. And to understand it, you have to go back to Book 7 of Plato's The Republic, in which Socrates describes what reality is really like, what he believes reality is really like. It's called The Allegory of the Cave. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to describe the concept. I'll leave reading it to you, but you could, if you haven't already, you could easily do. The, the story goes, the allegory. And by the way, an allegory is a kind of writing that contains layers upon layers of meaning, at least two meanings. There's the literal narrative, and then there's the figurative. Spencer's The Fairy Queen has the literal narrative of knights going on adventures, the Red Cross Knight in book one. Um, and yet there are many meanings there. It's a, it's a triple allegory, quadruple allegory. You've got the spiritual meaning, but you've also got a political meaning and a religious meaning. And sometimes they're, they're intertwined, and so it's polyvalent in that way. Um, but this is Plato's, The Allegory of the Cave. It depicts human relationship, let's see, human relationship to what he thinks is the truth. And it begins with a description of what's of inside the cave. And inside the cave, there are these prisoners who are chained in the story. Their heads are fixed where they can only look one direction at a wall, and on the wall, moving shadows appear. And the smartest among them, the cleverest, are those who can identify, oh, that's the shadow of oh, an angel, or a man, or a horse, or a bull. Here are the shadows here. And that's all they know are the shadows. They mistake the shadows for the entire world. The story goes, one escapes, and, it, and walks beyond this wall. So one comes behind the wall here and looks up and sees, wait a minute, the illumination on the wall is not the light, the fire is the light. And the shadows aren't real, it's the objects casting the shadows on the wall that are real. And here's perhaps a prisoner looking up, and the prisoner goes outside, he goes even further to the cave. He escapes ascending into the blinding sunlight and realizes for the first time that these are trees, these are people. Not the shadows, or not even the figurines that made the shadows, but here is real reality. And here above is the light of which the fire here is merely only a picture. 
He does what any good person would do. He returns to the cave to help the others. So this prisoner who's escaped, he's looking out, he's dazzled, he's gained some understanding. So he returns like Jung's hero returning to the hometown. Uh, and he starts talking with the philosopher. He says, hey, you know, you realize these, these shadows are not real. They're actually caused by actual objects, which themselves are copies of real objects, which exist beyond the cave. And of course, the prisoners think this is ridiculous and totally reject him, blinded by the illusion and more complacent in their own seeming wisdom to be able to identify shadows than accept the depth of their ignorance and to go forth into the light. And so this allegory and Plato's larger theory of the ideal forms really endowed Western literature and Eastern literature with a spiritual character. Characters embark on transformative journeys, seeking truth beyond the physical world. We've seen this, Dante's Divine Comedy. Uh, Dante, the pilgrim, ascends through heaven, ascends to heaven after passing through hell and purgatory, mirroring the cave escape in some ways. Edmund Spencer's characters in The Fairy Queen, constantly having to correctly discern the spiritual truths against their outward and sometimes deceptive images. John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, the pilgrim navigates allegorical obstacles towards the celestial city. It goes on and on. The romantic poets, such as William Blake, lose, they use symbolism to represent the ideal realm, attempting to lead readers from a false reality to a greater apprehension of spiritual truth beyond the material objects that we see. Um, even seemingly secular works like George Orwell's 1984 resonate with the cave's themes of deception and the discernment of truth by presenting a yearning for a higher reality. Um, so Plato's cave continues to shape literary exploration of the human condition and its enduring quest for meaning and reality. Uh, it's just not, it's not just a, in the domain of philosophy. So I'd say the spiritual endowment uh, is a huge component, is a huge endowment. But they didn't just provide representations of passion or a way of discovering spiritual truths. They also provided the tools of literary criticism. And it's the various tools we use today. And it, this is the third endowment and final endowment. Aristotle's poetics. Plato was a literary critic himself, but, but Aristotle really was the founding figure of literary criticism and theory. Uh, Plato's methods of discourse, they were dramatic. Uh, they depicted dramatic conversations with an interlocutor, so Socrates, putting to shame some, some hapless uh, man um, whom he's, he's talking with. It's very enjoyable uh, and entertaining. Uh, but Aristotle was systematic in all that he studied, encyclopedic. His poetics introduced a systematic way of understanding and evaluating literary works. And there's no writing or talking about literature without some recourse to or borrowing from one of Aristotle's methods. It's just that important. And it's brief, too. You can read it in, in a single evening. I think one of the most enduring observations Aristotle made was to insist on the artistic an organic unity of a piece of literary art, to judge it by its own laws. This is new. Plato judged a poem by how well it fit in with politics and with whether it was a true representation. Uh, the pre-Socratic critics, the earliest critics, Xenophanes of Colophon, judged the worth of Homer by how moral it was. And that inspired a whole school of allegorical criticism where people would say, no, no, Homer's good because all of this is just allegorical representations of, of human emotions. Uh, really interesting. And you, you even see this happening today, people evaluating the worth of literature. In America, um, I often see conservatives and liberals determining the worth of literature by how well it measures up to their own ideology. And Aristotle wanted to judge literary art by its own principles wanted to discover those principles, and he did so by beginning with the principles, the form of a poem, um, that 
that a poem, whether a drama, a tragedy, an epic poem, must contain a harmony of some kind. Its various parts must work together with itself and upon us in perfect orchestration. For example, this is what he says about plot. I just want to share a small excerpt from Aristotle's Poetics, uh, which I don't have. I'll have to upload it on the video. For now, uh, just I will read it to you. For some reason, it's not here. Perhaps it was... Ah, oh, here it is. Here it is. This is from Aristotle's Poetics, and it's from the Norton Anthology of Theory and Criticism, which I added to the list in that video on Harvard's 1983 list. This is the translation of it. We have laid down, says Aristotle, that tragedy is the representation of a complete, that is, whole action, which has some magnitude, for there can be a whole with no magnitude. A whole is that which has a beginning, a middle, and a conclusion. A beginning is that which itself does not of necessity follow something else, but after which there naturally is or comes into being something else. A conclusion, conversely, is that which itself naturally follows something else, either of necessity or for the most part, but has nothing else after it. A middle is that which itself naturally follows something else and has something else after it. Well-constructed plots, then, should neither begin from a random point nor conclude at a random point, but should use the elements we have mentioned. Those are beginning, middle, and conclusion. Okay, deceptively simple. Deceptively simple. It, it, it seems simple, but everything in a plot, everything in a poem, must work together. Um, my dad's an artist. He sometimes paints murals. And he used to tell me, he's, he'd say, you know what the difference between a photograph and a painting is? He says, a photograph is full of accidents. A painting is full of intention. And it seems like an obvious statement. But if you think about it, every little thing within a painting has been placed there. And a good artist will place everything there deliberately. And it's just so with a good poem. A poet must have a conception of the whole, or at least an intuitive grasp of its completeness within his or her mind before she writes the middle, beginning, and end. Now, there's something to say for first drafts, where you're just writing something, trying to figure out where it goes, but that also speaks to the insufficiency of first drafts. You must rework it into a unity. And this statement, Aristotle's Poetics, along with others, um, identify form as a central concern. Poetry shouldn't just imitate human life, but it should also do so harmoniously and according to principles. Aristotle was a close reader of poetry in some respects, but he was also a theorist. Now, Plato suspected poetry to be harmful to society for various reasons, mostly because it was a mode of fiction, therefore a lie. Um, because most of the poets who write about, who wrote about subjects like war or astronomy, actually never fought a day in their life and didn't know any astronomy. So Plato has great fun with poets who are just oafs, and Ion is a good example of this, but also his Republic. He doesn't think that poets should be a part of his ideal society. But Aristotle indirectly disagrees with Plato, I think. He doesn't take Plato head on. Uh, he, he, but he, does, he doesn't argue its importance within a context of a political system, which is what Plato was largely doing. Instead, Aristotle highlights the psychological benefits of enjoying poetry within a wider context. And so uh, Aristotle is mostly concerned with what poetry is made out of, that is language for him, and how that language should function and interact with itself, and to achieve a desired effect by the poet upon the reader or the audience. He's also interested in how people psychologically respond to forms like epic or tragedy. What's going on when we're watching the representation of suffering on stage? He sees it as providing an important emotional and educational function. 
So he, he discovers these underlying principles, the very principles by which this poetry should be judged. Um, how should language be used towards the desired effects upon the audience for emotional health? And the chief benefit of tragic poetry, a tragedy, for example, is what he calls catharsis. Critics disagree on the exact meaning of this word catharsis, but it, it generally means a purging. Uh, some words indicated as in Greek, uh, it's used in the context of the removal of something harmful from the body, something negative. So a tragedy will engage fear. It will cause us to behold suffering. But it also engages our sympathy, a necessary fac faculty of the human spirit that must be developed through exercise. We share vicariously through pity the horrors and joys that greet us in poetry, and it purges this irrational fear of pity in us. So this is something that's this key idea of catharsis, but it's also the underlying idea of catharsis, which is important. And I want to just share this quotation by Walter Jackson Bate. And this is from his um, criticism of the major text, which I, which was listed on the Harvard 1983 list as well. And he says, speaking of Aristotle's poetics, for beneath the theory of catharsis lies the general Greek premise that art, in presenting a heightened and harmonious imitation of reality, is formative that in enlarging, exercising, and refining one's feelings and in leading them outward, art possesses a unique power to form the total man or total woman, the total person in whom emotion has been reconciled to intelligence and harmoniously integrated with it. I think that's a great summary of this whole idea of catharsis and the psychological approach to poetry that Aristotle lays out. So we come to the end of the lecture now, and there's still so much to explore. Having treated the epic poetry of Homer um, and some dramatic poetry, I've completely neglected the tradition of Greek lyric poetry. And uh, I think in the next week or so, I'll have a lecture on, on, on Taylor Swift and, and Greek poetry, I thought it would be interesting to connect this continuity with modern popular art forms and to show how they're still engaging with these very primordial and early aspects of poetry uh, that, that go all the way back to Sappho, really, and, and Acreon. So that'll come later, but we've covered some important ground in this lecture. You've already begun to read the Iliad and the Odyssey. You're already at least five lines in to both. And now you have a working knowledge of Plato's allegory of the cave, and you've grasped the rudiments of Aristotle's poetics. So you might as well read what's left of Homer if you haven't. And you can go read the allegory of the cave in Aristotle's poetics for yourselves. You can read both in an evening, uh, in a few hours. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining, and we'll all be back next week with a lecture on the classical Latin backgrounds of English poetry. Thanks for joining, and until next time.